Okay, good afternoon. So it's my pleasure to introduce Jerome Fast. Um, and just to let you know, I'm using a microphone because we're recording the presentation. And so when we do questions and answers, we're going to use the microphone. Um, so Jerome Fast um, has a PhD in meteorology from Iowa State University that he got back in 1990. And he's been a senior scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory since 1994 and has been an NCAR affiliate scientist with our group, the Regional and Process Modeling Group here at ACOM um, since 2009, so for several years now, collaborating with us to improve WARFCHEM and, um, and do interesting science with WARFCHEM. Um, Jerome's an expert on local and regional atmospheric modeling and its uncertainties, um, looking at the ba boundary layer, flows in complex terrain, trace gas and aerosol chemistry, and the effects of aerosols on uh, clouds and other climate-related processes. Um, but he doesn't do just modeling. He's also worked a lot with field observations, and you're going to hear about some of those today. But besides this high-skill uh, field program from last year, He's also been a leader of several other field campaigns, including uh, two-column aerosol processing. There are too many names here. K I know. Cares, Milagro. Just read the acronym. We all know about Milagro. <laughs> and um, some vertical transport and mixing uh, field <laughs> experiments. So with that, um, appreciate Jerome giving a seminar today, and I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for coming. So the title of the talk is rather self-explanatory, I hope. Um, the, actually, the, the name of our field campaign, which is, you know, you have a field campaign, you have to come up with a name, and actually Alex Gunther actually came up with this. And so he was our original collaborator, and as soon as he came up with the name, then he decided to leave our lab and go somewhere else. So it's, it's, that's his contribution to uh, our field campaign. So uh, there's obviously, with any field campaign, there's many, many, many people to thank, and this is just one list, uh, list of them. And so this work was supported by the Department of Energy's Atmospheric Research and Measurement Program, which did most of funding most of the measurements, uh, but also supported by the Atmospheric System Research Program to do the science uh, part of it, which we're into right now. So I realize my title is kind of long, so I thought we need an alternative, shorter, and more accurate title. This is basically, so if, if you watch enough movies, you'll know what this means. <laughs> if not, then never mind. Um, so, the motivation for a field campaign is, is basically looking into shallow cumulus clouds. So why should we care about shallow cumulus clouds? Well, uh, convection is certainly an important component of the radiation budget and hydrological cycle in many regions of the world, but our models today don't do a very good job at simulating or predicting a lot of the uh, convective cloud characteristics or precipitation in many regions uh, of the world. And that's due to a lot of uh, a lot of reasons. Some of them have to do with not really understanding our coupling with clouds and aerosols and the boundary layer, and also land surface processes. And on the um, right here, I've kind of shown a figure taken out uh, from Coster et al. 2006, uh, showing they actually quantified the land atmosphere interaction strength in various uh, places of the world based on a global model. And so you have these hot spots over the world where, at times, there's very strong coupling with the land surface and clouds. And so one of these regions is in the central U.S., and obviously in, this, in the United States you get a lot of shallow uh, convection forming. There's a lot of subgrid scale variability, and that's another uh, reason why it's uh, not simulated uh, very well uh, right now. So just to give you an idea of broad kind of processes we wanted to examine during high scale. This is uh, an image of the beautiful Oklahoma landscape that we are, we're seeing there with typical shallow clouds. And so one aspect there, we want to look at the impact of variable surface uh, heat and moisture fluxes, and these could be due to variations in soil moisture, land use, and radiation. Also want to look at variations in turbulent mixing in the boundary layer. Also variations, obviously clouds are depend on ambient conditions in the, in the air as well. And we want to connect that to the aerosol life cycle. So we want to take that all the way from new particle formation, its growth in the boundary layer, 
and it goes up and down the convective boundary layer and ultimately forms cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, and that uh, will, some of those particles will activate, affect the size distribution of cloud droplets, and affect the cloud, al cloud albedo. And so typically we think of the aerosol indirect effect happening on big clouds, but actually it can happen on shallow clouds too. So another factor contributing to aerosols is that we're interested in is looking at variable biogenic emissions uh, in the region. And there could be a lot of heterogeneities due to changes in vegetation type, soil moisture, meteorology, and radiation as well. And the biogenic emissions will contribute to variations in secondary organic aerosols because aerosols will become coated with these, I've denoted the green here, denote SOA, so you'll have, you could have condensation as the air parcel becomes cooler and more evaporation as it comes down to the surface where it's warmer. And obviously relative humidity um, plays a big factor in, in terms of aerosol chemistry as well. And also, finally, we want to look at variable photochemistry. So it's not only how it impacts the chemistry that's going on in the boundary layer, but also how it's impacting uh, the land uh, heat fluxes. So to try and get some measurements in the area, this is primarily an aircraft campaign, which was conducted by DOE's G1 aircraft. Uh, we had the thing full of a lot of different instrumentation, uh, basically a full suite of meteorology, radiation, uh, droplet size distribution, uh, various liquid and ice content, although we didn't really sample many ice clouds in the summertime and we didn't get high enough. Uh, also cloud condensation concentrations at various supersaturations. Uh, for those of you interested in chemistry, we had uh, a suite of trace gases. So we had ozone, uh, sulfur dioxide, uh, carbon monoxide, NO and NO2. And Joel Thornton uh, from the University of Washington brought his uh, SIMS instrument, which is a chemical ionization mass spec. So it's our first mass spec that can uh, measure a range of volatile organic compounds. And those we're particularly interested in are isoprene and isoprene products. And though in aerosols, we have even some more mass specs, which are very heavy and weigh the, pl weigh the plane down. And so some of those include uh, the AMS and also a single particle uh, mass spec called mini splat. We also have various size distribution instruments to cover the range of, of size from very small sizes to coarse mode size. Also looking at aerosol number. And we also have a two different inlets. One's an isokinetic inlet and the CVI, which is the counterflow uh, virtual impactor uh, inlet, which will allow you to sample just the cloud droplets and not the uh, interstitial aerosols in the air. So the type of flight planners we did in the area, now this is a plot of central Oklahoma with Tulsa over here and Oklahoma City over here. And the plane was located in, in Bart Bartlesville, which was north of Tulsa. And you'll see a lot of the flight tracks in yellow are basically going over uh, the ARM super site. And there's as th that was done on purpose because we want to supplement the meteorological measurements that were made at the ARM site with additional in situ <coughs> cloud measurements aloft. In addition, the ARM site doesn't make that many aerosol measurements or trace gas measurements. And so the plane is really providing the, uh, the chemical measurements that ARM typically does not do, do uh, on a routine basis. And I just want to kind of show you some of the veget changes in vegetation in the area. It's not terribly surprising. You have a lot of crop types over the Arm Central facility. And, but you can also, you know, look at, uh, there's actually, you know, vegetation along rivers. And actually, as you get to the f more eastern location, there's the, the landscape changes from farmland to the west and to more uh, pasture and broken oak forests to the east, so you have more biogenic emissions on the eastern side and less biogenic emissions on the western side. So we were sampling in the region during two periods, one during the spring between April and May, and the other one in the late summer in August and September, so we could actually look at differences in the greenness in the area, because in the springtime, winter wheat is very green in the cropland, but later in the summer, it becomes dry and it's more brown in that area. And then there's changes on the east side in terms of how much you know, vegetation you have in the area, how many biogenic emissions uh, there are as well. 
And so we had roughly about 58 flower hours of flight time in phase one and about 48 hours uh, in the second flight period. Just to give you a standard photo of people that were in the field, this is also the pilots and the scientists. And there's always new things I learn every time I go on the field. And when pilots, when they do their, their paperwork during the day, they have to list how many SOBs they have on board. And it's not the SOBs you think they are, apparently. Well, I think it is the SOBs that you think it are. But they say it's souls on board, how many souls on board. But according to our pilots, scientists have no souls. <laughs> So that's what I learned in the, in the field. So it's a very different culture dealing with the flight crew versus the scientists, so it's always fun. Now it's Oklahoma, so even though we're shallow, looking at shallow convection, we're actually interested, you know, deep convection happens all the time out there. And we're basically flying as many days as we can. So even though there might not be shallow convection out there, we're having a flight day anyway because we're there. We're, we have the hours, we're going to spend them in the field. And so there are certainly some days when we're sampling when there's uh, convection out there, and this is just one example. And um, this is obviously a case where maybe we wheeled the plane out a little bit too early in the, in the day in there, and, and John Schilling managed to capture, you know, seemingly lightning striking the aircraft uh, in the morning. And so we'll have, that's a, that's a good one to show the safety people back at Department of Energy so that they feel about the operations. Um, but this is just a radar image that was showing the evolution of thunderstorms as the plane was flying, and this is just one flight we actually had to abort because the plane flew to the south, did a couple of different altitude legs, and did a couple of different altitudes legs north and south. But as it was flying towards the SGP site again, this little sucker kind of developed uh, during the uh, later part, latter part of the flight and the pilot was detecting too much lightning, and he said, he said okay, we're going to abort and uh, get out of there. So it's a little different from Mary's campaign in DC-3. We actually want to go towards deep convection. We were actually t trying to avoid deep convection, at least in the immediate vicinity. Um, in addition to the aircraft data we had, uh, we supplemented the surface measurements at the arm site. And so this is just a photo of the central facility and you'll see a number of buildings here where all the instruments are, are deployed. And they have what's called a guest facility where people can bring in their own instruments to supplement the instrumentation that's down there. Um, and so uh, during the phases one and two, we had additional SMPSs to measure aerosol size distribution. We we're really interested in looking at new particle formation and growth. So here's a period where we have a lot of particles in red at very small diameters that are growing in time, and so that's the new particle formation event that was observed. We also had a PTRMS to measure VOCs, and in parallel with the aircraft, we want to also measure, have similar instruments of aerosols at the ground. So we also had a uh, high resolution AMS at the ground, and also SPLAT, which again is another single particle uh, mass spec. During phase two in the later summer, uh, Jim Smith and a team of his scientists came down actually brought in even more mass specs uh, into uh, the, the field. And so there's this, I don't even know what all these sims do. They're just very flavor of sims. So I'm not a chemist, so don't ask me about what these things do. Other than they're measuring more details, like amines, which could actually contribute to new particle formation. And so it's really high de highly detailed things that we need to understand to understand the, the uh, reactions that produce new particles uh, in the atmosphere. It was kind of unfortunate that they couldn't come down during first phase. Yes? Quick question, that top graphic you're showing, is that more than a diurnal cycle's worth of time? Yeah, I'm sorry, just, yes, it's more than a diurnal cycle. And I'll show something shorter a little later. Um, what was I thinking? Yeah, I can move on to the next. Just to show an example, this is the guest facility here. And the one thing we had to do, we had to put an aerosol inlet which uh, they didn't have in this facility, and um, so that we could actually sample the aerosols essentially up at, I don't know what height this is, but so we're not doing it at the surface. So that's kind of a summary of the instrumentation. Now I want to just kind of go over the overall conditions between the two campaigns before getting into a little bit more details. And so I mentioned the chainness and greenness that we want to look at. So I'm showing two uh, NDVI images, one on May 4 and, and one, the other one on September 11th. And, and the yellow boxes here, I'm kind of showing where 
uh, the lighter green colors means that there's just less greenness and on the east side there's there's darker colors this is associated with more of the oak trees and where you would expect higher biogenic uh, emissions in these re in, in this area and um, so the question is how do these BVOC emissions actually change in time we'll need a model to kind of couple that with the vegetation data sets uh, this is obviously uh, looking at these variations are very important because these precursors will affect uh, the BVOC emissions and which will ultimately affect SOA and which could alter cloud condensation nuclei in the area. And we want to look at differences in the season to see whether these BVOCs and SOA uh, affect uh, CCN properties over the course of the summer. Another thing that's important to look at is, is soil moisture because that regulates the surface heat fluxes. It will also affect bio, uh, BVOCs because it will change whether there's stress in the vegetation or not. Uh, during the springtime in May, the, this, is, this is from the Oklahoma Mesonet, all the greens here indicate wet conditions. So it was really wetter than normal uh, during this particular time when we were out there, although there are pockets of drier soil moisture in the region. But by August, now it was mostly dry with pockets of wetter uh, moisture uh, in this region. So we expect that the weather, wetter and cooler weather uh, in, in May would lead to a weaker planetary boundary layer, and the drier and warmer than average conditions would lead to a stronger boundary layer uh, in, in the summertime. And we looked at some, this is just some climatological temperatures uh, with the average uh, given in green in Oklahoma over the period of time. I just want to kind of focus in on the gray periods, where, which was the field campaign period. It's kind of hard to see all the squiggles with the actual temperatures in here, but there are many periods where actually we, the temperatures are actually colder than normal uh, d than we were out there, and then warmer than normal in September. So when you're planning the field campaigns, you're kind of planning it on climatology, and then when you go in the field, it's never climatology. You know, it's never what you want. You always have to deal with uh, uh, those uh, types of things. For those of you who are cloud physics, here's just some uh, examples of the measurements from the in-situ cloud uh, measurements over the first phase. So we have liquid water content uh, on the left, droplet concentration frequency in the middle, and average droplet size distribution on the right. And obviously there's just a lot of variability. This is just really just plotting it up and not trying to correlate it to anything else. So this is basically showing a lot of variability only because there's more clouds on some days and less clouds on other days. And on some days, the clouds are more juicy than on, other, than on other days. And it just reflects the day to day variability of the cloud types and size that were sampled uh, during the field campaign. One of the things we're interested in is looking at this aerosol indirect effect, which in a previous field campaign in 2007, I believe, this CHAPS campaign in, in the SGP region actually looked at CO as a proxy for anthropogenic aerosols and then looked at the effective radius of cloud droplet particles that were sampled and lo and behold you would find as the anthropogenic uh, uh, concentrations were increased the, dro the effective uh, radius of the droplets decreased so it's basically just the Toomey effect so you get more, more par uh, cloud droplets and smaller cro cloud droplet size and so you can have actually see these uh, effects even in the, these small, shallow cumulus clouds. So we still have to look at that analysis. We haven't done the similar analysis for the high scale data yet. In terms of aerosol variations during phase one, uh, what I'm plotting on the top here is from the aerosol mass spec. So you have the total concentration in black and then the typical AMS concentrations and colors where the green is the organic matter sulfate in red, nitrate in blue, and ammonium in, in orange. And then this panel here is really just the fraction of the total in terms of composition. And what you'll see is there is a multi-day variation in concentrations. I think the scale goes from 0 to 8 micrograms per meter cubed. And a lot of people, you know, this we're in a rural area in, in Oklahoma, although we are downwind of some urban areas and so these values while they're typically lower than urban areas I wouldn't call them pristine 
by any, by any stretch of the imagination. They're certainly lower on some days, but there are many days where there's actually a, a lot of aerosols around. And most of them are organic aerosols, although on some days a large fraction of the aerosols are sulfate or nitrate. When we do have high aerosol concentrations, they tend to be associated with southerly winds, which I indicated uh, by these red, red periods uh, in this panel here. The north is blue and, and green is easterly uh, winds. We don't get that many westerly winds in, in orange. So there's some indication we have southerly winds. Maybe we're getting anthropogenic aerosols from Oklahoma City or other locations uh, coming uh, into the region but we still need to kind of couple that in some kind of analysis. Uh, the other thing, we've uh, compared the surface measurements with the aircraft aer uh, aerosol measurements, and it's kind of hard to see these circles here, but what we did was look at the aircraft uh, uh, concentrations as it was passing over the SGP site in the boundary layer just to, as a sanity check to make sure that our AMS on the plane and the AMS on the ground were actually giving us consistent measurements. And so for the most part, the actual, we were getting very good consistency between those aerosol mass specs. I also labeled here in N are the periods where we had new particle formation events at the, at the surface. You generally have those when the ambient aerosol concentrations are low because you don't have, uh, uh, the precursor gases aren't competing with the accumulation mode aerosols. And so new particle formula formation tends to like to happen when the ambient uh, PM 2.5 is relatively low. Also plotted on the bottom here are variations in, in CCN. They're somewhat correlated to the concentrations in the AMS, but not really because CCN also depends on size distribution and hygroscopic properties, which again we have to do some kind of correlation here to kind of look at uh, how we relate the observed CCN and the observed aerosol concentration and size. Now we do see some changes in the second phase, and we also see some uh, things that happen in the field, and that's sometimes instruments don't work. And one thing I don't have yet is the, AM is the AMS measurements worked, we just don't have them all processed yet. So what I'm doing is showing uh, ARM's ACSM data, which is a similar mass spec, uh, on the bottom, and it's also indicated by the, the green organic matter plot on the top, but I also supplemented it by the SMPS measurements in purple, which I then converted to volume and then used some standard density to get uh, a surrogate concentration from the SMPS, which actually follows the ACSM measurements uh, quite well. Uh, during phase two, we had a lot more periods with southerly winds, and actually the, the scale has changed here, so the organic aerosols may actually a bit, be a bit higher than they were during the first phase. And the number of new particle formation events were lower than during the first phase. And so there were fewer new particle formation events, but there were still a number of very good ones uh, that we'll show in a minute. What size range is being measured here? So for both the ACSM and the AMS, it's typically up to one micron as a max, but it's in my experience, it's more like maybe down to 700 nanometers, somewhere in there, that range. Um, and I haven't corrected the SMPS to have it match the same size, so this is just kind of a qualitative comparison at this moment. Now, one can ask, well, what are the sources of the organic aerosols? Are they uh, anthropogenic source or biogenic sources? So. I'm just presenting kind of a, an initial analysis of comparing the time series of organic matter with some trace gases of anthropogenic origin, which is the carbon monoxide in blue and black and toluene in red, with some biogenic, uh, uh, biogenic VOCs, isoprene in green and monoterpene in, in blue. So if you look at the, the time variability in the CO measurements, it actually kind of um, is pretty pretty correlated to the changes in organic matter. Same thing goes uh, for toluene. It's certainly not a, and I haven't done statistically the correlation, but by just by eyeballing it, it uh, looks pretty uh, correlated, which is suggesting a lot of this changes in organic matter are probably influenced by uh, anthropogenic uh, emission sources. However, if you look at a few periods, like you, ha you see a spike in isoprene and you also see a spike in um, organic matter, 
there are some periods in the spring here where there are, are some obvious indications that biogenic uh, emissions may be influencing the organic uh, matter concentrations, and uh, but it may not be from the monoterpenes. But when you look at phase two, things change uh, quite a bit. Now, I don't have CO during this phase, but if you looked at the toluene, again, it has a uh, relatively good correlation with the purple line or the, or the green line uh, up there. But what also changes dramatically are the concentrations of the BVOCs. And so if you kind of toggle between the first phase in May, uh, <coughs> April and May and the second phase in uh, September, you'll see the isoprene concentrations go up dramatically. You start seeing some diurnal variations now in the isoprene. The monoterpene concentrations are flat for a while, but then for some periods, now you get this adrenal variation as well. So maybe there are some local sources of these BVOCs that are coming in uh, that were not there earlier in the springtime. Don't know, and don't know yet whether there's some preferential wind directions for the monoterpenes. I need to look at this more closely. I think. The winds here may be more southeasterly, which could be bringing the monoterpenes in, and these southerly winds, maybe they're more southwesterly or southerly, and maybe there isn't a monoterpene source upwind of the SGP side at that uh, particular period of time. Now we can also look at the SIMS instrument on the aircraft in more detail. Again, this is just looking at it in a bulk sense. So I plotted the percentiles of IOP1 versus IOP2. With isoprene on the top, monoterpenes in the middle, isoprene products uh, in red, and again the organic matter in green. And the one thing I want to point out here, and I, I just concluded the dotted line here for reference, is it looks like there's generally higher isoprene actually during IOP1 aloft than there was uh, during IOP2, which is actually different from what was happening at the ground. The monoterpenes look rather similar between the two IOPs, but the isoprene products are actually higher during IOP2 than IOP1, and at least that's consistent in the sense that maybe what's going on here is that we have a lot more isoprene emissions, but it's actually just more chemistry going on, which is converting the isoprene into isoprene products uh, during the second phase. And then the question is, how is that, how are those changes uh, affecting the organic uh, matter concentrations as well? Now this is a very simplistic way of looking at it because I probably should segregate the results into regions that have more biogenic er emissions and less biogenic emissions. Another way of segregating is look at sunny conditions versus partly cloudy conditions because photochemistry is going to affect uh, how, what kind of chemi photochemistry you have out there and also influencing the emissions as well. So just kind of take this with a grain of salt. This is just, this is what the data is. This is just showing things that are changing in time. So now I want to move on to some specific examples. And so kind of show some interesting things on new particle formation, organic aerosols, some convective cloud populations, and then finally wrap up with land atmosphere cloud interactions. So on new particle formation, this is a case, uh, a couple of cases that uh, Jim Smith was really interested in. So I want to contrast, or at least compare, uh, two events. That one happened on September 11th, and another one happened on September 17th. And so, again, this is a shorter period. This is a 10-hour um, a period on this day. So you have the new particle formation events starting roughly at 15Z or 16Z uh, right here. And then these particles are growing in time and kind of has this uh, banana shape that is typically seen during these uh, new particle formation events. And coincidentally, we were flying over the SGP uh, during this period defined by the box. And so we're really kind of lucked out on this day in terms of getting surface measurements of new particle formation and then aerosol concentrations aloft at the same time. Because a lot of times when people go out and measure new particle formation, formation events at the surface, they're just doing it at one point. You don't know whether it's happening at the surface or happening aloft and being entrained down. You have no idea whether it's a regional effect, event or a local event. Uh, but in this case, the aircraft measurements are, are showing relatively high, co higher concentrations in red and orange and yellows over a relatively large uh, region. And then most of this is being flown at one elevation 
uh, most of the time within the convective uh, boundary layer. On September 17th, we had a slightly different flight pan plan. We're actually flying at multiple altitudes, but again, it was a case where we were flying over the SGP at about the time when the new particle formation event occurred. And um, again, you can kind of, if you look the colors here, you can see higher colors in the boundary layer and lower, uh, more cooler colors uh, aloft. But ultimately, it's going to be really interesting to kind of correlate the uh, the changes. Uh, in the concentration and the spatial variability of the new particles in this area and how they grow in time. Uh, uh, so we can see the effects on uh, SOA. And, on, and also on this date, we actually passed over the central facility many times. So we could actually look at some kind of gradient uh, in the boundary layer uh, during this particular case. And the advantage of this case, too, it actually had a, we actually had partly cloudy conditions where we were sampling. So now we can actually take it from the, the new particle formation phase, the accumulation mode phase, and correlating those to CCN and seeing what's happening inside of the clouds. Some measurements that Jim Smith's group did on this day, this is basically the same event on September uh, 17th. So here is the new particle formation event. And here's some measurements showing SO2 in black increasing and uh, sulfuric acid associated with the SO2 in red. And so it's obviously an indication that sulfuric acid is contributing to the formation of these new particles uh, at this time. And he's also looking at other measurements from their various SIMS instruments, and those are plotted here in the various colors. And since I'm not an expert in this area, what Jim has noted that uh, there are, are changes in most of these compounds slightly before the new particle formation events. And you see, and actually, if you, here's a new particle formation event, and you have no new particle formation here. And so you have, obviously, before these events, you have a lot of some variations in some of these quantities that you don't see on the next day. And so there's some indication here that maybe some of these amines and other things that they're measuring are also contributing to the new particle formation event on this day. And then, you know, you don't see these things uh, contributing uh, on the next uh, day. And then there's a the question is where are these things coming from? And uh, so a slight analysis of look at least looking at where SO2 is coming from because that's a lot easier to look at. Uh, we can look at the aircraft, uh, this is on May 3rd, so it's a different day, but we had high concentrations of SO2 in these two parts of the transects. If you look at the winds, they're from the south, uh, southwest, and so it looks like this is probably the same plume. And when you look at Google Earth and start looking at uh, um, zooming in on Google Earth, and you actually can find these things that look like industrial emission locations. There's actually several of these near Enid, Oklahoma. And so these are probably highly likely sources on this data that's contributing to SO2 and sulfuric acid and also the higher, smaller particles uh, in this particular region. There's also a power plant uh, to the east of SGP and a refinery to the east of SGP that we actually sampled high concentrations of small particles all the time, and SO2 all the time. So these are really rather big emitters, and the other ones are emitting uh, at lower uh, concentrations. And so these are just some images of these facilities in the area. And so one thing to do when once we get to modeling is to compare what the emission of inventories are reporting for these facilities with what we're actually seeing in the field in terms of what's being emitted with SO2. And I can tell you already, some of these things are missing from the emissions inventory, like, like these things. There's, I've yet to find what these things are, and yet we're sam actually sampling stuff coming out of there. So it'll be interesting to look at that in more, more detail. So. All, we have a lot of nice data to look at new particle formation events, but these things are coupled to uh, organic aerosol growth and, and to bigger sizes. And so we want to now look at the aer organic aerosols. So I want to show like a, a tale of two days. And so one day is May 7th. And so this is our flight track. SGP is located here. And since we had southerly winds, we had two upwind flight tracks. And it's kind of hard to see, but we have multiple stacks on these. And the pilots are so good at flying at the exact same lat latitude, you can't see what's being plotted here. So 
Next time I go in the field, I'm going to tell them fly 100 meters over this way. So when, it, when we plot these things, we can see the difference. But we'll, we'll see what they say about that. But anyway, you have higher organic concentrations, up to 4 micrograms per meter here. Given the winds, these might be due to Oklahoma City. And maybe the organic aerosols we're seeing here are more biogenic emission because of higher biogenic emissions region here. And the question is, do we have any kind of anthropogenic, biogenic interactions uh, in the middle there? The other one I want to show is May 11th. Uh, we are basically flying a very similar flight plan. However, a front has come through this area shortly, shortly before we uh, flew. And so it's actually bringing in lower aerosol concentrations to the north and some of the higher concentrations that were originally uh, produced by southerly winds are now being affected back uh, towards the south and the east. And, and this day actually is partly cloudy as well. So now to look at some of these stacks for May 7th. So what I'm plotting here on these three patterns is now just the multiple stacks that we're seeing at these three locations. And so at all altitudes in the boundary layer, we're seeing higher concentrations of organic matter uh, to the western side and also in the middle transect and also over uh, SGP, lower concentrations uh, to the east. But what happens when we look at the, the BVOCs? Now this is a little complicated because what's happening on the SIMs, we can't measure all these species at one time, we have to toggle between them. So sometimes we're measuring isoprene and then sometimes we're measuring isoprene products which makes it kind of complicated. That's just a function of what the instrument does. So I'll just explain on this upwind leg, we are actually measuring isoprene products at all altitudes. And what you'll find is the highest concentrations are actually on the east side and lower to the west. And also you see a vertical gradient in the isoprene products as well, with the highest at the lowest altitude and then decreasing aloft. So does that mean that there's low emissions out here? Well, maybe, maybe not, but in this middle transect, we actually can see some isoprene all along, uh, that's being emitted all along this transect, which actually some relatively higher concentrations to the west. So maybe what's happening here is at some point, maybe more of this isoprene products are being now consumed into the particle phase and going into SOA on the western side. This is just me speculating right now. We have to run a model to actually see if that's actually uh, occurring. And then we also see high isoprene, uh, higher isoprene emissions essentially when we're flying on the way back to Bartlesville over a more forested uh, region. Now on May 11th, things are a little different. Again, the aerosol concentrations are lower, uh, but still there are more aerosol, organic aerosols happening on the western side. What you'll see here is these purple values mean we've turned on the CVI inlet, so we're no longer sampling the interstitial aerosols. We're now just sampling the cloudborne aerosols, which I'll talk about uh, in a couple slides. Um, but now if you look at the isoprene products, what's different on this day is you have a lot more isoprene than the previous day. It's not, I wouldn't say it's a factor of 10 more, but somewhere between a factor of 5 or 10 higher concentration of isoprene near the surface and the isoprene products are actually less. And so, I, so I, what I suspect on this day, because you, maybe you have some clouds, you have some reduced photochemistry going on, maybe the emissions have changed. So you have a buildup of isoprene, but the isoprene isn't converting to isoprene products, and nor is it going into SOA. So in addition to having some dilution with the northerly winds bringing lower concentrations aloft, there's probably likely to be less uh, production of uh, SOA on this uh, day. Now the, one of the most interesting things we're seeing is actually happening in these clouds. So this is just a picture of the aircraft flying above the clouds before it dives down into the clouds and just some sampling in the clouds. And so again I'm showing a time series of the Sims measurements showing the isoprene products in, in this case in blue and the isoprene uh, in green. And so you have the plane flying at a relatively high, going up to, this is actually going up to three kilometers, doing a profile, coming down into the clouds, and then you'll see variations in isoprene products uh, down here, which is kind of hard to see for the scale. But if you blow it up over a relatively short period of time here, and if you look at the, when the clouds are forming, or where the clouds occur in, in gray, 
we'll actually find that the isoheme products are going down every time we go into a cloud. And then once we go in between the cloud, then the isoheme products go back, back up. And if you looked at a different leg and looked at isoprene, you'll, you'll see the opposite thing happening. You'll see isoprene going up in the cloud and then going down outside the cloud. Uh, uh, these are, since this is gas phase stuff, it, it, all, gets, it all gets through. It's a, it's, a, it's a total, yes. For the gas phase. Yeah, for the aerosol stuff, it's just the cloud droplets when we're in the, in the cloud. Um, so one now it's like, what's happening with the aerosols then? And so Alla has her mini splat uh, instrument, which actually looks at the uh, aerosol components, which are color coded here. And so most of it is dominated by organics and sulfates, which are green and, and uh, red. But what I want to point out is in, during these cloudy periods in the gray bar here, this yellow indicates this IEPOX SOA. So what she's, she's detect, what she's detecting in these cloud droplet residuals is IEPOX uh, signatures uh, in yellow. So a substantial fraction of the cloud droplet residuals seem to be uh, showing some perhaps aqueous chemistry uh, with the biogenic species of uh, organic species that we're seeing. And every time we go into clouds, we, we tend to see that. And in fact, almost every day, we see this as well. So it's a very robust feature that we're seeing. And it's also, what, what you can't see on the scale, we don't have it plotted really well, uh, it's actually the IEPOX in the gas phase is anti-correlated with the, uh, the, um, the droplet residuals. So what's happening is the gas phase stuff is decreasing and it's going into the particle phase and uh, when it's in the, in the cloud droplets. So and this is actually a really interesting finding uh, in terms of uh, the chemistry that's going on within these clouds, and maybe we have enough measurements or measurements here to actually implement some new chemical mechanisms in our models to evaluate whether we can actually predict uh, this type of chemistry that's going on and whether that actually matters. But what you also see here is it looks like you know these clouds are all you know forming and evaporating all the time. So what's happening with this IEPOX SOA, it appears almost like it's, it's going back to the gas phase. It's just kind of evaporate. It's like it's very volatile. It doesn't remain in a non-volatile state. Um, so it could be something that's just formed inside the clouds and as these, these clouds evaporate, everything just kind of goes back uh, uh, to the gas phase. But we're going to have to do more analysis on the single particle data uh, to see what's going on. Another important thing is, is biomass burning aerosols. The splat aerosol can actually detect these things. And this is on May 5th. The uh, orange particles here are biomass burning aerosols. So it's basically saying a majority, almost 80% of the particles are bio of biomass origin. And this is the total organic matter that's observed on this day, so it's going up between two and four micrograms per meter cubed. And so we have the single particle measurements are saying most of this is biomass burning. And lo and behold, when you couple look at back trajectory analysis on this day, which s suggests that the air mass parcels over about three and a half day period go back up into Canada. And if you look at the fin emissions that Christine generates, they, they go in generally in the area where there was actually a large region of wildland fires in Manitoba. And actually the grays here actually have the highest emission rates. So there are actually some forest fire emissions in British Columbia and, and Alberta as well. So it seems to confirm that we were getting biomass burning aerosols, but they were coming from very, di very distant sources that can contribute to the organic aerosols in this area. Yes, Christine. There were some, so it could be pick, picking up some fresher. The question is, these. This is the highest source, yeah. and the light. And this is um, the lighter blue here is even a you know larger source, and this is a smaller source. Yeah, I know Kansas went up pretty good last year. Too. Yeah. So, but that's something we'll have to look at in more in more detail to see, you know, which ones really contributed, despite the fact there are fewer fires here and lower emissions, 
the proximity could still mean that they're contributing most of the aerosols. So, but we can do that with the modeling studies uh, to, to test that. And this is just a, a pretty color shot to show that if you look at the splat measurements in every day, they're different. This is not, you know, this is, if you think that things are rather simple, they're not. And so these are y'all using the same, same label. And you see some days are do dominated by sulfate, other days you have a nitrate, and other days you have biomass burning, which dominates, and you get these crazy combinations. And so even in a place like uh, rural Oklahoma, things can be rather complex. So moving on now to what, you know, we want to take these organic aerosols and start looking at uh, cloud condensation nuclei and their effect on cl convective cloud populations. Just want to show one, one day that I think is our golden day, which was August 30th, um, the golden day at least in terms of convective clouds. And so I'm showing a satellite image uh, from MODIS at about 16Z, but actually during the morning this was actually all clear. It was clear skies everywhere. And about the time the plane took off from Bartlesville, you started seeing shallow uh, convective forming over a large part of the region. However, when we were flying, there were still some regions of clear skies over SGP and, and parts of Kansas. Um, so we were doing this flight pattern of just kind of looking at a boundary layer stack over SGP. We were lucky enough that the clouds were just starting to form while the plane was out there, and so it's basically diverted from the flight plan so that we could actually sample some clouds on its way back uh, to Bartlesville. And you can also see relatively high aerosol concentrations, uh, possibly from this refinery and the, st and the still water power plant. So some, in some places, well, at least not, you'll see in the next slide here, some of these aerosols could be intersecting the uh, convective clouds eventually. Um, let's see what's going on here. So now the next MODIS image from Aqua, which is now at almost 20 UTC, you get a very interesting distribution of convective clouds in the region. So when you had a rather uniform shallow convective uh, cloud population, now it's broken off into a very non-uniform convective cloud population. You have isolated uh, regions where there were deeper convection had formed. Uh, you have and you have uh, more organized deep convection off to the west, and some of this deeper isolated deeper convection actually are producing cold pools, which you see these clear air blo blobs out here, which is clearing out the shallow cl uh, convective clouds uh, in this region as well. But even within the shallow convective areas, things are still very are now very uh, inhomogeneous. inhomogeneous. So things uh, get very complex. This could be a difficult case to actually model. And in this case, we just did an out and back to SGP. Here you see some of these uh, convection that are have, you know, these very small turrets. They la don't last a very long time. They'll go up and dissipate. Some of them grow and precipitate, but other ones uh, don't. We essentially did a leg here where you sample below the clouds and then within the clouds, and in this case we have these higher aerosol region forming uh, where we're sampling clouds here and lower aerosol concentrations here, which give us ability to kind of compare and contrast these uh, two different cases. Um, in addition for this case, I want to kind of point out some things for land, uh, cloud, um, these uh, land surface interactions and kind of bringing back this notion of variability in land use in this region and how that affects uh, quantities that could affect, affect clouds. And so we have an um, in infrared thermometer that's pointing down from the aircraft. And so we can look at skin temperature at, at um, a tenth of a second interval as we're going along. And that's denoted by this blue line. So you see there's a lot of variability in skin, skin temperature which is varying by over 10 degrees Celsius. And so if you have a dark surface that may be cooler and a lighter surface could be, could be hotter. And so now we also have, I'm plotting this with the downwelling or just the radiation that the aircraft is measuring. And so what you find is when we're underneath clouds, not surprisingly, the radiation dips um, uh, from the ambient air. And then of course, then you get a very 
large reductions in the radiation when you're in clouds. But ultimately what we want to do is kind of correlate the, the changes in temperature with what we're seeing in the radiation. Another piece of data that's useful is actually to evaluate on our models is if we're predicting shallow clouds or we're we predicting the radiation that's reaching the ground for the right regions. You know, whether we have the right cloud amount, whether we have the right droplet number distribution, right liquid water content, and whether we can actually predict the, the radiation that's passing through uh, these clouds. And I did one look at this, if you looked at the HER model, which is run by operationally by NOAA, and this is a kind of a complicated plot, but what the color contour here you're seeing is from HER, which is a WARF model at three kilometer grid spacing. So you have variability in skin temperatures, which with very cold temperatures over the, the rivers and reservoirs and higher temperatures over the land. But then when you plot it with the observed skin temperature, and this is all at the same scale, there's hardly any correspondence whatsoever. In addition, I've kind of plotted the time series with the simulated in red and observed in blue. <coughs> And what you see a couple of things. Obviously, the bl and the blue has actually been averaged to 30 seconds, which is approximately three kilometer uh, grid spacing that the plane would pass, pass through. And so the model is not predicting the spatial variability in the skin temperature and also has a bias, has a warm bias. Essentially, most of the time, the red is higher than the blue, especially later in the afternoon. And indeed, the surface temperature has also had a warm bias. And it turns out that NOAA had noticed these warm biases in this version of the model and fixed the model during the summer. So by the time we had our second phase in there, kind of ran a similar uh, analysis. And what you find now is that the biases start to go away. And actually, when you look at the, the observed temperatures that are predicted by her, uh, WARF, they agree pretty well at the surface uh, with the data, but also the skin temperatures are uh, now have the bias uh, that's going away, although it's still not representing the variability uh, in the um, in the surface temperatures. So what I want to do now is this kind of data is kind of useful to kind of look at large eddy simulation stuff. And so we've already run a, a large eddy sim. Oh, great! It's on the wrong part of the screen. I can see it, but you can't see it, and that's the wrong size. You stop this. Still too big. That's kind of strange. That's better. So this is the colors of vertical velocity, and ultimately you'll see these little white patches here. Those are clouds forming, and so this is a horizontal cross section, and then these are two vertical cross sections. I believe this is a north-south cross section, and this is the east-west cross section. And so now you see all these nice little shallow clouds forming at the top of where you have the updrafts uh, that are occurring. But you see more and more clouds forming. Initially, it's more uniform convection, shallow convection. But then shortly, it turns into more uh, bigger, more organized areas of convection. And now you see also the clouds actually become deeper. And there's periods of time we actually get rain out of some of these clouds and strong downward motions and purple. And at the end here, you can actually see, like here's one uh, cold pool boundary in the vertical velocities uh, that form in time. So you see a lot of the features that are seen in the satellite data, which is very encouraging. And so for me, I, I do more modeling and chemistry. So I want to eventually add chemistry on here, actually simulate the aerosols in here, and look at cloud aerosol interactions uh, that are going inside these clouds, and ultimately compare that with aircraft data. Yes? What's the upper funnel? Uh, say it again. Um, oh. What, what what are we seeing on the lower panel, on the upper panel? Is, is one fourth or one half? It's actually the entire LES domain, so it's about 30 kilometers wide. Oh, they're cross sections oh. along the dash line. Yeah, the, these are cross sections along the dash line. So here is, it goes through the middle of the domain. Oh, I understand. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I'll actually run it again and if I can. So it's actually starts at about, um, yeah, these, every, every snapshot here is a minute change uh, in the model, model space. So 
there are some characteristics here that agree with the satellite data, and but what I want to say, the model is has a rather simple treatment of the surface conditions right now, which ultimately we want to perturb this with more complex surface conditions and see how this affects the cloud distributions, and then look at variability in aerosol concentrations and how, what their impact is on as well. And so with the northerly winds, you can kind of see these eddies are coming from north to south. These, these clouds are forming on very short time scales, and they can be dissipating quickly. Other ones last longer. And you see this is actually a pretty big one. You see some downdrafts, and all of a sudden there's another big downdraft uh, that's forming, and then a lot of the cloud is, is uh, just gone, or at least moved off of the scale of the cross-section. So now going back to this guy, let's see. I think I want to skip these other clouds on LES, and we're just starting to evaluate some of these LES simulations with the data, looking at the variability. Um, particularly, we have vertical velocity from the aircraft, which is useful, and we also have vertical velocities from Doppler LIDARs. The nice thing is we have not just easy, shallow conductive cases, we have more difficult cases with multiple cloud decks in them, and these will be very interesting to test with LES uh, modeling as well, to kind of move away from the very simple cases into the more uh, complex cases where we have some of the aircraft data to evaluate this. So to wrap up, uh, um, we have a wealth of new data that's collected during the campaign. Uh, I think we're going to ultimately have new insights into how, into the coupling of the land surface, land atmosphere interactions, turbulent boundary layer mixing, SOA, convective initiation, and in particular I showed a number of uh, results from new particle formation, SOA, and, and transitions in convective clouds. Now we're into the phase where we can actually look at not just data analysis, but start to do uh, models. So we're running a, a, at PNNL and other groups are looking at a range of models from LES, which is explicit simulations, to more L, uh, mesoscale, which is parameterized uh, populations. Want to do sensitivity tests, compare convective parameterizations and see how well they do at uh, cloud fraction in the area. Because even if you're running at a few kilometers, you're still not resolving all of these shallow clouds and maybe there still is a need for a convective parameterization in the model. Also look at uh, using at various different parameterizations in WARF to look at cloud aerosol interactions and use WARF with and without chemistry to help uh, improve parameterizations for mesoscale models. So, and I'll just leave it at a, some modeling I'm actually doing right now while I'm here. So if someone wants to walk down my office and see some other results, I can actually uh, explain what we're doing. It's kind of hot off the press at looking, looking at cloud distributions and um, aerosol distributions. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any questions? And you have to use the microphone. So you showed very nice um, satellite images of cold pools and so on, and was were those generated with cold clouds? And if you contrast or compare that with your LES simulation that uh, seemed to go up, was that uh, warm rain you had uh, generated there, or was uh, was the LES was doing warm rain only? I, only. I haven't. Uh, I will confess I haven't looked at the other species in there whether it got cold enough to get ice. That's one of the things we're going to have to look at. Obviously, in the satellite data, I think some of these convection is getting, it looks like it's getting deep enough to be ice. And how high is that model top? 12, I think. Okay, so For the LES high. run, yeah. Any more questions? In terms of photochemistry and clouds in the LES model, mm -hmm. are you going to consider some three dimensional cloud effects? Eventually, there is uh, what I, in one of the slides that I had actually, has some potential 3D effects of radiation from clouds. Um, <coughs> oops. So if you look at, when we're flying in the plane, if you look at, stare at this stuff long enough, you'll see that the radiation actually goes much higher than if it was in clear sky. 
So there is actually some evidence you might have some 3D radio effects. And will that be the first thing we do? Probably not. But to put in some kind of three-dimensional uh, radiative transfer code in the model would be useful to kind of see what those effects are and whether that's actually significant on a, on a bigger scale. Is it feasible? I mean, yeah, just consider this three-dimensional effect in the LES modeling. Is it feasible, do you say? I don't know how much the 3D radiation scheme costs, but hey, LES is already expensive. Why not throw some more expensive stuff at it? <laughs> I think it costs a lot. Yeah, I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure it costs a lot. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that the first step would be 3D modeling. I think you can do some just by treating the fuse and direct separately and mm -hmm. playing some games. So direct sun is showing or not, the fuse lights from clouds or from sky, do some mm -hmm. linear superpositions. Yeah. That's why I said it was... Uh, there's a famous paper by Lance et al. 1996 that does that in some video. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. So um, I was surprised to, to see that high uh, levels of isoprene mm -hmm. in Oklahoma. So it's a 15 ppb is, uh, is what I saw. <laughs> uh, Joel Thornton, so who has us in, was surprised too. We were because oh, <laughs> okay. we were expecting, we were thinking, oh, we're not going to see anything. Oh you yeah. Know? <laughs> So it's, it's kind of surprising. And the other thing we'll need to do is, since Alex Gunther has his Megan model, which calculates emissions, is mm -hmm. questions, are the models getting the right vegetation type and the right conditions to actually generate those kind of thing, kind of concentrations that we're actually seeing uh, in the aircraft and on the surface data as well. Mm -hmm. Quick question about the aerosol measurements. I think those are dried, right? The aerosols are dried? Yeah. So that their, their ambient masses are actually quite different up high than near the ground because of the different humidities. Right? Yeah, I would have to ask our mass spec people how much of an effect that would be. Uh, this <coughs> I. I had a, maybe a similar question on isoprene, but just as a comment, um, in 2013 we were there and um, our PTRMS only, I think we might have saw, seen one or two PPB of isoprene from the surface. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, at least if you looked at just at SGP, that's what we're seeing. But the thing is the aircraft fly, is flying around there. And, during, and it depends on the time of year too. During the second phase, we were seeing things that were more than one PPB. I didn't. I kind of cut off the max there. I don't know what it actually got up entirely. And I think our PTRMS was measuring through the entire summer, and so I wasn't looking at other times of the other months either. So just to follow on that, if the aircraft's seeing concentrations that's high, that's even more surprising because isoprene reacts away so quickly. Right. And so the question is, why isn't it reacting away as quickly as it is? I just want to see one slide a few seconds longer. Okay. Can you uh, put on slide number 19? 19. Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Someone's paying attention to the numbers, man. <laughs> see, this one is... Um, yeah, you put them there. I read them. That's 20. This one? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, just it struck me that the monotropines are anti-correlated with temperature, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. There's more at night. Yeah. There, the gray. It's kind of hard to see the gray shading here, but I tried to gray shade the uh, the nighttime periods. So it looks like there's more monoterpenes during the nighttime period. Now, part of that could be to the boundary layers collapsing yeah. to shallow. Seems, seems a lot, yeah, I agree, but seems like a lot for boundary layer effects. And uh, now it's hard to tell the scale, but it seems almost like could be easily factor of five. 
Okay. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to see that once once more if I glanced it right or not. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Jerome some more. He's, um, thank you. Jerome is here for another two weeks. Two weeks. About, and he's um, in, the in the first floor of ACOM over near Gabby. So. Don't tell him where I am. Absolutely. <laughs> you just invited them to look at pictures. I'll stop by my office and tell everybody. <laughs>